Um, I'm a stay safe ambassador, so I'm just going around the Poplar, Tower Hamlet, handing out leaflets and face masks and finding out um, if they plan to get vaccinated. Out and about in East London with a Covid team from Tower Hamlets Council. Thank you very much, darling. Do you want to tell us about what you think about the vaccine? In the queue, yes, looking forward to it. I think everybody should take it. I haven't had the vaccine yet, sort of waiting for it. So you're just waiting and hoping you get it soon? Um, absolutely. I'm 88, so I got it early. It's a waste of a shot, really, wasn't it? 88, you know. It's not a waste. <laughs> Those folk don't need convincing, but the grassroots ambassadors have their work cut out. This community has been badly hit by COVID, but there's scepticism that the vaccine is the answer, with some people believing outlandish claims. I don't know. I am scared, though. What are you scared of? I don't know, just everything that you hear. And uh, just because I don't trust the government, really. We hear things like the vaccines come out too soon. And then we hear things about how people say, oh, the government is trying to control them. Um, what's in the vaccine? You know, how do we know what's in the vaccine? When it comes to my turn, it's, it's probably been gone away already. <laughs> you don't seem you that know? keen on it? Uh, no, 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 no chance. For me? No. no. No vaccine? No. Why? For elimination. Eliminate what? Elimination for the peoples. What, eliminate the people? Yes. With the vaccines? Yes. Why? I, I think this one. There's no evidence to support any of these claims. Newsnight's been shown the latest data from East London of first dose vaccine take-up rates in the over 80s. Across a region of 2 million or so people, 65% of white residents aged 80 plus have been vaccinated, 57% of elderly Asian residents and 36% of their black counterparts. If you look specifically at Tower Hamlets, a more deprived borough than the average, while white 80 plus take up of the first dose is lower at 59%, the fall is even starker for Asian residents at 36% and down to 28% take up for elderly black communities. These kind of numbers have been worrying councils across London and further afield. Some communities are much more nervous to come forward and, and that includes our, our black and Asian communities who have been worst impacted by the pandemic and, and it's not surprising because they've, they've seen systemic inequalities, there's sometimes lack of trust in, in health services. We are having conversations uh, telling them how safe it is because actually because they've seen that disproportionate impact it's even more important that they do come forward but it's, it's a range of people actually the highest hesitancy we've seen uh, in the insight work we've done is actually among young people um, and, and you know there's a lot of work to, to do around that. How are you feeling? Good. 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 Domiciliary carers Humera and Asha have turned up for their appointment at this vaccination centre in Tower Hamlets. Yeah, my name is Dr Tambo, one of the GPs in the area. Mm -hmm. So, you're going to get the Covid vaccine? Yeah. yeah. And is this your first or second dose? First one. Frontline social care workers are entitled to the Covid vaccine. I'm going to give you the first vaccine, it's the Oxford one, the AstraZeneca. So again, similar things, the side effects are, are just the same as having a flu vaccine, okay? okay. So, but Asha took some persuading. Before I was so scared. Why? I don't know, I might die. You might die? Yeah, so scared. My kids, my kids. What did they, they say? They said to mum, do you want to die? Don't take the vaccine. I said, I'll have to take it. Why did they say that? Where, where did, what do they think about the vaccine? Maybe they, they think about, the, you know, the vaccine is no good. They got that information from yeah, social media. Yeah. Yeah. My message is don't watch or listen to the negative yeah. things about it. Um, everybody has to have it. Have you told them you've had it? No, I didn't tell them. <laughs> I'm going to tell them tonight. I'm going to tell them tonight. Is that what you're picking up, that it's the young telling the old? In our surgery, yes. It's, it's, it's actually a similar kind of thing we are seeing. So from a lot of um, times we're calling up patients who have got some hesitancy or concerned about having the vaccine, it's because of what they've heard from the younger generation in the family. Newsnight's seen data gathered by another East London council, Hackney, on vaccine hesitancy by age. While only 9% of over 75s polled said they were unsure about getting the COVID jab and none said they definitely would not, scepticism increases in the younger cohorts. And 21%, more than a fifth of the 16 to 24s polled, said they were unsure, with a further 7% saying they definitely won't be vaccinated. Are you all right? I'm all right. Dr Tambers, a local GP. He believes to change hearts and minds, medical professionals need time to talk and reassure. Here we go now. 
At his own practice, he says in the end, only 12 patients of 600 have refused the COVID jab because clinicians contact those who say no to discuss it. But vaccine scepticism for him is close to home. I think when people were personally messaging me, when I talk about, I'm talking about friends and family were messaging me about saying, would you take the vaccine? What do you think about all this information that, that is out there? I think that kind of hit home. That kind of made me realise, actually, we do need to work on this. We do need to put some effort into providing um, the right kind of information to, for patients. I think the most sad thing is in my surgery at, um, in, in Tel Hamlets, we've had the same number of deaths in the last two, three weeks that we've had in the whole pandemic put together. The new variant has raged across Tower Hamlets. 131 local residents have died here with COVID so far in January, out of a total of around 340 deaths during the whole pandemic. In this lockdown, you can see the human cost. You can see not one member of a household passing away, but actually two to three members. Every day I have someone phoning me up or contacting me or another family member saying, oh, I've been sent this text message, I'm supposed to go and have this vaccine. But hold on, um, if I have this vaccine, will this happen to me? Will my blood change? And why is it so quickly that they found a vaccine? It's people from black and Asian backgrounds to Bangladeshi people to poorer communities to white families who are hesitant. Councillor Khan and her husband are dropping masks to a family whose relative recently died of COVID. In Bengali, Mr Udin pleaded with people to get vaccinated so others don't lose their mothers suddenly as he has. For their councillor, the more communities see people like them getting vaccinated, the less sceptical they'll be. Now they're off to drop food to another constituent. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You had your vaccine last week? Yes. It was fantastic. Yeah. And huge pressure off my mind. Good. I know it's not the be-all, end-all, I know, but it's the only hope we've got. One of my family um, texted me the night before, said, don't, don't go, John. Um, and they sent all these press cuttings from all over the world. I'm sure she must trawl the internet. A few streets away, Rabina pointed us towards Kim, whose mother died of COVID in a care home early on in the pandemic. She doesn't believe the more outlandish anti-vax claims. Even so... If you got a call tomorrow saying, come and have a vaccine, do you think you'd go? I'd like to say yes. Personally, I'm still a little bit unsure. But no, I don't think it's going to change anybody's DNA. Um, I just, it'd just be nice to make sure, though, it doesn't have any effect on people in the long term, which nobody actually knows. It's early days in the vaccine rollout. There's time for the government, for local leaders, to convince people like Kim. The huge official effort to spread facts and positive messages is already underway. Katie Razzle reporting. We asked the government to come on this evening. It declined, telling us it was working with different communities to get the correct vaccine information out. I'm now joined by former Facebook executive, now Lib Dem member of the House of Lords, Richard Allen, Imran Ahmed, chief executive of the Centre for Countering Digital Hate, and Dr Annabel Showimimo, who works to increase engagement with healthcare among people of African descent. Uh, Annabel, if I may start with you. You're a doctor, you're talking to people all of the time. Why are the people you're speaking to hesitant? Good evening. Yes. Yeah, so I think there's a range of reasons and it's really, really important that we don't homogenize people. So as you saw from the earlier report, the um, reasons are varied, um, cultural, religious, um, and I think often overlooked is some of the historical uh, mistrust that some communities, particularly de de um, deprived communities, um, have um, towards healthcare professionals and medical institutions. So um, amongst my own family and friends, um, I've heard uh, people refuse to get the vaccine because of bad experiences they've had with providers, unfortunately, in the past, which means that they think that um, the, the, the vaccine and the vaccine vaccination scheme is um, some, 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 for some reason, corrupt or um, not, not going to be good for them. Other people, as pointed out in the, um, the earlier segment, 
do feel that it was too quick and there's a lack of information and if more information was delivered, may be more willing um, to engage with, with the vaccine. However, there's a deep frustration, um, I think, for many, um, like myself and health providers that work with communities, because these um, events were predictable. There's been um, historic issues with some communities not trusting um, medical institutions because of past bad relationships, um, feeling they've been ignored in the past. So um, these, these issues were predictable and we could have started some of this engagement work, I think, at a much earlier date. You're also, you mentioned your family there, you're also trying to convince your grandma, is that right, to, to get vaccinated? Why does she not want to be vaccinated? Um, so, yes, there are a number of people close to me that um, have been less willing to get the vaccine. Um, in that instance, part of it is feeling that medical professionals in the past have not been trusted. Even though myself and other family members are doctors, that's not enough to convince her and others like her that the vaccine is, is trustworthy. Um, so I think there is a lot of work to be done and um, senior people and MPs making videos um, are likely not going to be enough because from certain populations, they don't trust these people as it is. Well, let, so let's, let's, then... get, let's get into that because you've brought us on to information and Imran, Imran Ahmed is joining us as uh, the founder of the Centre for Countering Digital Hate. You've been looking at where some of the, this disinformation comes from. Where is it coming from and, and what's the incentive for those who are spreading it? Well, good evening. Look, what we have is, I mean, what we heard just now was the demand side for uh, conspiracism, for misinformation about uh, uh, vaccines, but there is a supply side too. There is an industry that's pumping out misinformation about vaccines, typically trying to raise doubts. It's not actually trying to sell a case, it's trying to pepper people with misinformation such that they're overwhelmed, to also overwhelm our ability to check those facts, to, to, to fight back against it. And there are three themes that they're trying to sell. One is that COVID isn't dangerous, two is that vaccines might be unsafe, and three, that you can't trust typical medical authorities. And this industry has about 59 million followers across all social media platforms in the UK and the US. Half of those 59 million, 29 million are in fact following just 10 individuals. And they've been given free reign to spread misinformation, which is designed to be incredibly compelling. These are large organizations. They have up to 100 staff. They have millions of dollars in revenue. And the revenue comes from selling their own false cures because what they want to do is persuade us that we can't trust doctors, we can trust them. And guess what? They've got a tank of nebulized bleach to sell you. So that, I mean, it's, you've given us a hint there as to how they might be making money selling certain things and, and these, these companies having, you know, good sort of arm, manpower to do this and, and putting the effort in. Are they targeting specific groups as well? Are they making sure that they have specific messages? So think of them as a normal industry. They are trying to sub, so they will tailor their, mar they'll tailor their marketing for different, for different markets. So with, for, for example, a Muslim, they might look at a pre-existing concern that Muslims have about, about food substances and drugs. They might say it contains non-halal products. Well, how do you know it doesn't contain a non-halal product? Or they may say to African-Americans, for example, we've been watching today, um, particular sort of resurgence of, of, of stuff targeting African-Americans, they might talk about the Tuskegee experiments in the 1920s in which the, the US state experimented with syphilis on African-American people. I mean, an, an atrocity, sure, but not comparable to what's happening now. By, by sort of a, a mixture of allusion, illusion and delusion, they've managed to persuade people or dissuade people, really, from taking the vaccines that can save their lives. And we see that targeting of micro, that sort of micro-targeting to communities. It's particularly powerful online. They do it almost like a political party or like any major brand would. This is a sophisticated industry working to persuade as many people as possible with tailored messaging not to take vaccines. Let's bring in Lord Richard Allen at this point because it's about the ability to see this and the ability to share this. And you, of course, work, having worked for Facebook, how comfortable are you that so much of this rests on Facebook's shoulders? I mean, I, it shouldn't rest entirely on their shoulders. It, as we've heard in the report, and I very much agree with what um, Annabelle was saying earlier about the mistake of seeing this as a homogenous problem, and Imran's identified some of the specific actors. I think we need to go from the general. There is a problem with 
anti-vax misinformation to the very specific, which is what are the things that are causing harm in Britain, that, that in Britain are uh, reducing us from the vaccination rates we want, potentially down to a lower vaccination rate. And that, I actually think, requires a conversation between the platforms and government and civil society experts uh, like Imran and others so that we actually focus on the very specific problems. Uh, that way we've got a chance of dealing with it. But just, just kind of going to Facebook or Twitter, deal with the anti-vax problem, I don't think it's very satisfying. It, it won't give the results we want. But, but having been on both sides of this and being in the House of Lords now, do you think that the government can or needs to make harmful disinformation illegal? Because if it was illegal to post this, it wouldn't be the way it is, would it? I mean, that's one part of uh, the solution. But I think we do need to be realistic that, you know, we have freedom of expression. We don't have the First Amendment, but we do have a general right to freedom of expression in the United Kingdom. And I think the government knows that, certainly for the sort of crazier end of the conspiracy theories, as opposed to, you know, stuff which is, is very much targeted at harming people, I think they'd have a challenge, frankly, to, to have any law stand up. That, that forbids people the right to say crazy stuff. Imran's shaking so, his head. Hang on, I've got to bring him in. Why are you shaking your head, Imran? The, the platforms have already said that they will deal with anti-vax lies. So you don't have the freedom to lie freely on a private platform and spread information that might lead to people taking decisions that put their own lives and those of other people's at risk. There is the harm principle to go with freedom of speech. You could go back to Locke to look at that. But here's the, the, the fundamental issue is that we're being gaslit. So we did a study to look at what happens when you even hand the platforms anti-vax misinformation using their own reporting tools. But what we did is we got volunteers, youth volunteers from Restless Development, who they had no public profile, fewer than one in 20 bits of misinformation that was reported to them was taken down. So you, the key actors, are you the key saying, actors... I'm sorry to break in here, but you, just, just are you saying that we need laws to change at the moment? We don't have the rules in place? Or are you saying that it's about what Richard was saying there, about bringing people together to actually work at this in a different way? We've been doing that. For, so I, I've been working with Her Majesty's government on an, an, a, two different task forces which deal with disinformation of different types, that dealing with violent extremism, and that dealing with specifically with the COVID stuff. The, the, the Facebook is there. The other companies are there. Civil society is there. The issue is that we have systematically been gaslit by companies that have told us they're doing their utmost when, in fact, they're doing absolutely nothing at all to deal with. Let's just take the key actors, the 10 key actors that create that have 29 million followers. They have enormous followings. They're not on fringe platforms. They're on Facebook. OK, just They're on Twitter. Richard, They're on a, br a brief reply to that, because you were then shaking your head, because I want to give the final word to, to Annabelle. <laughs> It's just not accurate to say that nothing's happening at all. Now, it may not be enough, and there may be other mechanisms to, to uh, actually support a regulatory framework that holds platforms to account. But to say there's nothing, I just don't think is accurate. Uh, and also to say that, that, you know, Britain is likely to criminalise a lot of this speech, I don't think is accurate. We may, may want the platforms to do more, but they're doing more to suppress legal speech. And we should be clear uh, that that's the base on which we're asking them to do this. And, and Facebook has taken action millions of times, but whether it's the right action or whether it's doing it enough is another debate again. Um, Annabelle, what do you want to say to people watching this who fall into the hesitancy camp as a doctor? You know, you've got the platform here at Newsnight. What do you want to say? Um, firstly, I want to make it clear that with COVID-19, what it's doing is showing some of the inequalities we have in the harshest light of day. So for communities that are fearful of taking the vaccine, their fears aren't irrational because they're based on systemic inequalities that they felt. And um, medical professionals are, um, there are people like me that are seeing your concerns, know about your concerns, have been advocating for them for a long period of time. Um, in this time, we need to kind of pull together um, and help people understand the information that's out there and decipher mistruths and build scientific literacy. But I think it's really important that people understand that this isn't born out of irrational fears. This is founded on truth and inequalities that people experience on a daily basis. And this is why we're, we've got to this point. And what do you think will change their mind? Will it be that it, there's a tipping point that every, you know most people around them have been vaccinated? I think there's different there's different groups of people. There are some people that are hesitant and with more information and waiting a bit to see that people are OK, hopefully the uptake will increase. There are some people that firmly believe that the vaccine is embedded in an establishment that has is against them 
um, they live in a, a, a in a circumstance of deprivation, and they the only way we're going to convince them is through long term hard work of us working together um, for people to realise that we have their best interests at heart. And we didn't they didn't get to those views overnight. Yes, well, um, they uh, got there's, to there's, those... there's great talk of collaboration from all of you in different aspects. Thank you very much for collaborating with us this evening.